So anyway, we can start now by doing a meditation. The meditation is a pretty usual meditation, but nevertheless, sometimes you can go really, really deep and we can see how it goes. So, if you'd like to get yourself, first of all, in a comfortable position. We do have things like cushions. If you'd like to sit on cushions, I've got two cushions behind me, my goodness. Still some more people coming in, so please ask people, can you be on time? I know one of the reasons why people come in late these days is because they don't go flying overseas anymore where you have to get in on time, otherwise you get not on the aircraft. So please, if you can, come in now. So with my mask on, can you hear me okay? You can, in the back. People aren't saying anything, perhaps they can't. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, if you like to close your eyes, and with your eyes closed to bring attention to how your body feels right now. This is the first arising of mindfulness when we meditate, to how our body feels. Because of that, it does help to close your eyes first. With your eyes closed, you can be much more sensitive to your bodily feelings. And that gives you the opportunity to make sure you are in a good physical position. So I just already noticed that the cushion is not uh, in the proper place. I'm going to just fidget a little bit. It's better to fidget at the beginning, get it comfortable so you can be still at the end. With your eyes closed, you can be a little bit more specific with your awareness. So put your awareness on your legs to begin with. How do your legs feel? Can you make them more comfortable by adjusting something? If you don't pay enough attention to your bodily posture when you begin meditation, what happens is that your body gets stiff, aching, painful, and either you have to move or you carry on enduring, and then meditation doesn't really work for you. It's not that you can't meditate, but you meditate without enough preliminary attention on your body. So please get the body nice and comfy. First of all, your legs. Can you improve them? Your butt. And I do spend special attention on my bottom because too many times, especially if I sit long periods of time, if I don't get that right to begin with, it gets sore. In the old days, my legs used to go to sleep. They become numb. And that was a concern. So get sure, my, make sure my butt is really comfy on the cushion. And then my back. People do have sore backs. Why? Sometimes there are accidents happen. But if you have got a reasonably good back, then sit in a position where your back is comfy. 
and not sort of comfortable for a moment, but comfortable for half an hour, the meditation time. I feel my back and I move it around to get it in the optimum position. And then my shoulders, make sure my shoulders are nice and loose. So there's no pain possible to grow in my shoulders. And then just down my arms, making sure my elbows and wrists and hands are all in a good position. And if you do have any sore part of the body, you can experiment by just focusing on that sore part of the body. And focusing and just look deeper into it and give it some kindness. Kindness is what relaxes everything. You're warm to that feeling, even though it might be a bit sore or painful. When you're warm to it, it gets looser, more peaceful. And you realize that that little, what we think is a preparation, is a great part of insight, understanding, and how to allow your body to be peaceful. I was careful with the words, how to allow it to be peaceful, not how to make it peaceful, how to allow it. And then go back up to your shoulders and your, your neck and throat. For anybody who has itchy throat or a sore neck, to make sure that the neck is not in pain. I usually, you may notice me, I just move my head from the left to the right, backwards and forwards, to get the optimum position for my head on top of my neck. How does it feel? And now my head and neck feel balanced. And lastly, I, as you've heard me before, I go to my face. How does my face feel? Especially the muscles around the eyes and the mouth. Because that's where some emotions manifest on your face. is how people can tell whether you're afraid or whether you're happy or whether you are angry. It is how your facial muscles are configured. And by learning just how to relax all those muscles, you can actually learn how to lessen many of those negative emotions. When our face is at ease, the emotions also calm down. And we have a greater sense of peace in our body to start with. And at this point, I just turn to my awareness to the whole body, just all linked up together, joined together, making sure that it's all at ease. And I do enjoy literally doing this part of the meditation because my body is relaxed and is at ease. I just got to relax it a bit more now, just adjusted my robe. When the body's at ease, I know it's at ease enough because it feels delightful. A sense of joy, happiness comes up. And uh, a very wonderful insight happens now that when 
the body feels peaceful, joyful, delightful. The peace, the relaxation deepens. It's like the joy, the delight takes the body into a more relaxed situation. And you may notice that this is a little hint for you, an insight. If ever you can't sleep at night because of the heat or noise or something, you can get some relaxation in your body and it's delightful, you'll soon fall asleep. And by being mindful of the body, relaxing it part by part is a wonderful way. But anyway, once the body feels delightful and relaxed, it's like the preparation, not just bodily, but your mindfulness is strong enough, your care is strong enough to go into the inner world of the mind. How peaceful are you right now? How does it feel? Not in your body, in your mind. And by practicing this little method, you will find that when you can see your mind, it is actually not scary. It's actually quite peaceful and joyful. And peace is delightful. What is delightful is easy to focus on. And the delight, the peace, only happens now. Straight away it helps you focus on the present moment. If the present moment is silent enough, in other words, the delight will overcome that your tendency to think and to plan or work it all out. Shh. See if you can learn how to feel and listen and to know without giving things a name. What are you experiencing right now? How do you feel? Can you be kind to this? So just like relaxing your body, you relax your mind.
and see if you can bring enough peace to your mind right now in silence to feel, experience for yourself the joy of a mind which doesn't have to think about things which doesn't have to remember the past or worry about the future which is just here Yeah, there are things to worry about, but we can do that later. There may be things to recall, but we can recall it later. Now it's meditation time. Relaxation. Peace. When you're ready, you may even observe your breath. Breath coming in, breath going out. Breathing in peace. Breathing out, let go. I'm going to be quiet for the next five minutes.
How peaceful are you now? How calm does your mind feel? Have many of the thoughts just disappeared? When the thoughts go, that's when you feel peace. How does your body feel? When my mind is peaceful, the body also feels so deeply relaxed. Not, not an ache or a pain inside of it. If you know how your body and mind feels after even only 30 minutes of meditation, it's very encouraging and you realize why you would like to meditate more and more for the health of your body and for the peace in your mind. I will now ring the gong three times. Please listen. And at the end of the third ringing of the gong, you may open your eyes to complete the meditation. Excellent. So if you would now like to adjust your body, just give it a stretch here or drink some water if you need to drink some water. And then in a couple of minutes I'll begin this evening's talk. And this evening I've actually decided on a subject. This evening I'm going to talk about fear. Because someone was asking me about this. One of the Sangha members in Perth, Sangha members in our group. Great. So hopefully you're comfortable enough now. Very good. Okay, so here we go. <coughs> so there are many causes uh, which create what we call fear, anxiety in our mind and it manifests in our body and causes us a lot of difficulty and problems in our life. We used to see that even when I, believe it or not, I was a school teacher for one year and uh, being a school teacher, you can see that some of the <coughs> some of the children who I used to try and encourage, they thought they were hopeless at doing things. It wasn't they were hopeless; they were just afraid of being judged and criticised. And so, because of that, whenever there was any type of test, either like a written test or an oral test, or just you know just being asked a question they would clam up and they would not answer because of fear. Because that anxiety was so strong, they thought they couldn't do certain things, certain subjects. And I've seen that for many times in my life, even 
and our monks who I've grown up with when they were very young and see them, just, they said they never did well at school, they never went to university and I thought, why? Because they were obviously very intelligent young men and young women. Why? And a lot of the times it was simply because somebody embarrassed them. And when they em were embarrassed in front of the class, they never wanted to do that anymore, so they just disengaged for what should really be the joy of learning. And when I saw that so many times, and so many incredible young men, especially because I was a monk, who could have done so well in life if they just had a little bit more encouragement. So they weren't afraid anymore, not afraid of failure. And of course, one of those young uh, people who I saw was one of the students I had in my class when I was a school teacher. And of course, every, see, can you hear okay? Okay. Of course, the um, teachers before, the year before, they told me that this boy had come bottom of the class in maths. And I was a fellow who had to, to um, teach him maths that year. And so, having heard he'd come bottom the year before, I wanted to see if I could teach him, encourage him, to see whether that was just the fact he couldn't do maths or whether there was something else at, at fault there. So every day when I taught him something in maths, that uh, I would always go by his desk and ask him, did you understand that? Have you really seen what they we're trying to show you here? I gave him more attention than any other kid in that class for the whole school year. And I just wanted to see whether it was he just lost his confidence or whether just he couldn't do maths. And the reason I tell the story, I only tell the stories which work, was <laughs> was that he came top that year. I got him from the bottom of the class to the top of the class just by encouraging him, giving him confidence. Yes, you can do this, don't be afraid. And so much in life, whatever you do, if you're afraid, of course you will fail. And you don't need to do that. With a bit of more confidence, it's amazing what you can succeed at. And of course, the Buddhist story behind that and I haven't told this for so many years. If you haven't heard it before, it's a very wonderful story. And that was the only TV show which was remotely Buddhist when I was growing up, was this TV show called Kung Fu. <laughs> and, when I, and that was actually the year I was a school teacher. And even though you know, my fellow school teachers, you know, we talked about all sorts of stuff and I said I was a Buddhist and I watched this show and they said, it's Buddhist? I said, yeah, well, it was a sort of. Why is there so much violence in it? <laughs> well, that's all they got to show. And I thought it's the violence is what makes it sort of uh, what people would watch. It makes it sort of uh, entertaining, I suppose. But anyhow, this particular episode which always stayed in my mind was of the little monk being trained by the blind master. And the little monk was called Grasshopper, if you remember that name. And little Grasshopper was taken into this very dark room at the back of the temple. And in that dark room, it looked like there was a swimming pool there. But it wasn't a swimming pool. It just a big, looks exactly like one. And because the master was blind, he asked little grasshopper, go and take a look and tell me what you see there. And he said, well, there's, there's lots of liquid there. And at the, at the bottom, there's lots of skulls and bones, and bodily stuff. Yes, little grasshopper, because that isn't water in that little tank, swimming pool size. 
That is acid, concentrated acid. And can you see that plank of wood going from one side of that tank to the other side of the tank? Yes, 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 Master. You will have to walk over that plank from one side of the tank of acid to the other side. And if you fall in, if you fall in, you will just add more bones to the bottom of that swimming pool size a tank of acid. And poor old little grasshopper was scared. And even though I was a young school teacher, seeing it on the TV, I was scared too. It's amazing just when you see these things, how you get emotionally drawn into them. And feeling that fear was an important part of this little exercise, why I remembered it, because then he took little grasshopper outside and said, you have a whole week to train, nothing else you have to do. And there was a plank of wood, the same size, but just uh, on top of two bricks on either end. Practice, little grasshopper, practice. Because in one week's time, the test will be real. You'll have to walk over strong, concentrated acid. And if you fall in, I will not be able to help you. So little grasshopper saw the piece of wood outside and it was so easy to walk on. He could walk on it blindfold, backwards, whatever. But when the one week of training was over, when he was taken into the dark room for the second time, when he was told by his master, get on the end of that piece of wood and cross this big pool of strong, concentrated, deadly acid. He was scared. Me too. I didn't want little grasshopper to fall in and kill himself. And as he started walking, you could see he was not confident because a plank of wood of the same size stretched over acid is much longer and much thinner than the same size wood just on two bricks in the courtyard. That's how our perception works. And so little grasshopper was walking over the acid and you could see his fear was starting to make him become unsteady. He started to wobble. He started to shake. It looked like, he really looked like he was going to fall in. And then you know what happened? Commercial break. <laughs> Had ads on, stupid ads about washing machine and toothpaste and stuff. And I was wondering what was happening to my friend, little grasshopper. <laughs> and after the commercial break, they always go back just a little bit earlier than when they actually cut off. And he saw a little grasshopper get more unsteady, swaying back, was, it looked like he was lo losing his balance. And at the very last minute, he fell in. He fell into the pool of acid. You know how kind senior monks are? The senior monk there, the blind master, just burst out laughing. So it's really, really cruel. Poor little grasshopper was burning to death. But he, but he wasn't. The little grasshopper was splashing around. The master was laughing. He said, it's only water. It's only water. They just put those, those skulls and bones in the bottom of the pool just for special effects in order to make it look scary. And then the phrase which he used next was the one which was most important. One I always remember. The master said to Grasshopper, why did you fall in, little Grasshopper? What pushed you in? Fear pushed you in, little Grasshopper. Fear pushed you into that water. 
And that really made a big impression on me. It is how so often in life, it's the fear makes you fall. It's the fear which makes you sick. It's the fear which makes you fail. A lot of times, what you fear the most is actually what you make happen. He was afraid of falling in, so he fell in. And that's something which is powerful, the psychology of even sickness and illness. Of course, now you know where I'm coming from, why I'm saying this little talk. But sometimes we have the problem with COVID. It is a problem and you've got to be careful about it. But a lot of time it's the fear, which a lot of times it's not mentioned enough. If you think you're going to get COVID, your chances of getting the COVID increase. If you think you're going to fail, your chances of failure increase. If you think you're going to die, sometimes you've seen people because they feel they're going to die, that's a cause for actually dying. In the Buddhist, almost like cosmology, understanding of the mind and the body, that fear, that lacking, that the best, the French have the best word for it, the joie de vivre, we wanting to, to live, that can kill a person, the fear. And so we have to be one thing which you should be afraid of is fear itself. I have been very healthy over many years. And one time when I was very tired, exhausted, and there was one of the uh, parents of one of some of the uh, people who work for this place and look after this place, is Gita here this evening? Or Chippy? Oh, you're there. That was your dad. Your dad was a doctor, a medical doctor, and uh, he saw that I was really sick, didn't know why, so he actually admitted me to hospital at the time, in Rockingham Hospital. And what type of medicine did he practice? Gynecology. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was admitted into hospital for six days under a gynaecologist. Of course I was wearing my robes because that's all I have. So where's your pyjamas? I don't wear pyjamas. Just robes. They're very simple monks. And so they said, well you've got to have pyjamas in hospital. I said, this is all I've got. You can either have these or nothing. What do you want? <laughs> and in those days people were really kind and nice. I said, okay, you can just wear your robes. I wear my robes in hospital. When they, Wearing the robes in hospital, under a guy in the colleges, you can imagine what the nurses said. <laughs> Who are you? You're in the right ward. But one of the things we did in that ward, there was three other gentlemen in that ward, and a monk. <laughs> and then, having nothing to do all day, we just had these stupid conversations. And one of the conversations the four of us had, is what's, because you know, some of them have been in the hospital many times. That was my first time in hospital for years. And they, we asked, what's the worst medical procedure? And someone said, oh, this procedure. And I said, no, 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 that's easy. This procedure, no, no, that's easy. And I think, if I get it right, I don't know if I remember this correctly so many years ago. They said, oh, a barium enema is the worst. And this poor man in the corner, his face went white. He said, that's what I'm having this evening. <laughs> Stupid way people talk. So don't ever do that. Because <laughs> fear is something which is probably even worse than some of the diseases itself. Imagine that you're going to get injected by someone and they say, this is going to hurt. This is going to hurt, you know. It's really going to hurt. What's your reaction? The reaction, you can understand, you tense up. And because you tense up, it hurts much more. That's one of the problems. Yeah, so many, you've had many occasions when these sorts of things happen. 
that there's one occasion walking barefoot in Thailand and I stepped on a four inch nail. It went right through my foot. How many went, ooh, it hasn't gone through your foot, what are you saying that for? <laughs> and I just looked at it, you know, you see you know, the one end on the underside of your foot, the other one poking up through your foot. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. Actually, it never hurt. It must have got some acupuncture point, I don't know. But it never hurt until the monk with me said exactly what you just said. Ooh, that's terrible. And once, <laughs> once he said that, then it started hurting. Why? You can see just how our mental perceptions can add so much onto our experience of life. And again, that is part of fear. That is part of why we have more suffering in life than we need to have. Doing things like having talks or even somebody asked me the question from Germany. They asked, can you please talk about this? There was sort of a family trying to have a kid, trying to have a baby, but they've failed so many times. And sometimes that they have uh, tried everything and had miscarriages. Okay, I'm a man. I don't know what it's like to have a miscarriage. I'm a monk as well. I've met so many people families have been trying really, really, really hard to have a kid and these things happen to them. And of course, having been put under a gynecologist in Rockingham Hospital many years ago, I suppose I learned something about gynecology. <laughs> Very little. <laughs> but what you do learn is that sometimes what happens you know, if a person does get, manage to get pregnant, their fear of failure their fear of things going wrong, their fear of having to endure this again, that is something which stops their success. They're afraid. That's one of the reasons why sometimes they do come to monks and we're just chanting for them. It works. Is this like powerful, some of the chanting the Buddhist monks can do? Or is it just we're encouraging, giving some confidence, giving some possibilities? Yeah, just because it didn't work last time doesn't mean it's going to not work again. It may fail the first time, give it another chance, who knows? And that encouragement is one way of overcoming fear. And sometimes the reason why these things you know, give you so much suffering and disappointment big expectations, but in the end, just you think it's failure again. That makes it more likely that you'll fear failure the next time, or won't even go there. So instead of having the fear of failure, let go of the fear and see what happens. That's why sometimes when you do do chanting for people, just a blessing, so a monk or somebody they, they are confident of, when they actually come on and he gives them a sort of a good bit, bit of a boost, takes away their fear, give it everything they've got, and sometimes it works. And sometimes they say, oh, what type of chanting do you do, did you do? That was amazing. Now we had a kid because of your chanting. I said, no, all my chanting did was to take away your fear, give you confidence, especially it might happen this time, so give it a try to take away the fear. That was why it worked, more than anything else. Nothing which was supernatural, but everything which was giving you confidence. So the next time you can relax much more. And that's the same in all parts of life. You know that one of the things which many people are afraid of, and I was talking about this last week with a few people, was I live over in a bushfire extreme zone. And we did have a bushfire there on 
Yeah, it was January the 31st. It's almost an anniversary. It's a good time to talk about it. January the 31st, 1991. Oh, 30 years ago. Yeah, it is. No, it's uh, 31 years ago now. We should have had an anniversary, do something like light some fires or something. For to <laughs> <laughs> no, we can't do that. <laughs> but Ajahn Chakra was the upper then, I was number two. Ajahn Chakra was having some rest and recuperation down south somewhere. So I was in charge there when the big fire came. And on that day, we, you know, we had in December 45 degrees down in in serpentine, really, really hot. On this day, January the 31st, 46 point something up in serpentine, before the fire came. Afterwards, it got quite hotter. So, and that, that still is the second hottest day in Perth. It was actually the hottest day ever in Perth recorded at the time, but then later on, a week or two late, later, it was hotter. But imagine that, 46 degrees. And then in the afternoon, maybe two o'clock, one of the Anagarikas came to my hut and said, look at that, a big pall of smoke was rising just off Gobby Road, that's a, the road south of Kingsbury Drive, where we live. We were all ready, all prepared, for when that fire came, it was huge. And when it hit the trees, bang, the trees went. <laughs> Please excuse me for waking you up, but sometimes when you give a talk, <laughs> when you make it sort of alive, then actually people just, their ears open up a bit more. <laughs> so, <laughs> but they exploded, it was like bombs going off. It was amazing to see, you know, it was really a bit sort of sad to see how nature could be destroyed so quickly, but there was explosions going off. So we were told to evacuate, even though we shouldn't have done that. It was actually when we got to the evacuation point, the head fire brigade guy said that was a mistake, but we're told to do that. Oh well, yeah, you had to do it. And he told off the bushfire guy who ordered us to. It was a bushfire guy who was scared. There was a couple of the people there at the time were scared too. Because this one gentleman, <laughs> sometimes when there's emergencies like this, we had all the cars outside. I said, get in the cars, let's drive off. And so one of the guys, he was actually waiting and just coming up for some reason or another. When we were told to, to evacuate, he decided that was the time to change his trousers. <laughs> Honestly, I can't make that story up. It was true. He decided to change his trousers. So he came out, you know, showing off a lot, but with you know, his trousers trying to pull them up. <laughs> I thought, oh my goodness, who am I? Anyway, so we all got in the cars and we got to the evacuation point. But afterwards, I do also remember that Curtin University sent a group of psychologists, psychology students to the monastery a couple of weeks later, because they wanted to do like a, a psychology survey. You've just been through a very, very, very dangerous fire. And they asked me and a few other monks, said, have you been able to sleep at night after this? Yeah. <laughs> Have you been waking up in the middle of the night, you know, dreaming about fires? No. <laughs> Have you got, what was it, post-traumatic stress? No. <laughs> and so they took all their reports and we you know, said, no, this is true, this is how we, what happened. And afterwards, I remember just going there and just asking them, said, how did the report go, the research go? He said, it was hopeless. We can't use, <laughs> you can't use what you said because it's too anomalous. It just, it's not what's supposed to happen. But I was actually quite happy about that. You were tested in a life-threatening situation and you weren't afraid. 
And I think that's a lot of time what saves your life. If you are afraid, you panic, you take down your trousers. Why? I don't know. <laughs> it could have been any of the monks, because we don't wear trousers, okay, as one of the, one of the visitors. <laughs> Why people panic that much? Because the fear makes them do stupid things. Just like a little grasshopper. He fell in only because he was afraid of falling in. So little by little, one thing we should always be aware of is fear. What is actually fear anyway? A lot of the time is fear is we're actually afraid of losing something which is too precious to us. And even in relationships, many people come here, they bring their partners, and sometimes they meet their partners here. It's uh, sometimes in some afternoons or evening, it's, it's um, Dhamma Loka Dating Club. I'm being honest. <laughs> but sometimes, why is it that sometimes people, that when they come together, why don't those relationships actually last? And sometimes, I've seen this, uh, they're so afraid of losing their partner. The fear dominates their relationships and they do not act sensibly even like following their partner or just always checking her up or checking him up just in case. And what happens then is that the fear destroys their relationship. Even in a relationship one-on-one, -on -one, it does need a lot of trust for that relationship to, to, to become good. Also, that relationship to last you know, when you have that trust and even allowing people. So you now it's you know, this is your home with, with us, so it's up to you to make sure you use it the best you possibly can. And also, for those of you who have visited, stayed at Bodhinyana Monastery, we have a large number of monks there. We're never short of monks. And that is quite strange in Australia. Sometimes people say you've cornered the market in monks. You've cornered the market sometimes in nuns. There's more nuns at Dhammasar than any other place. Why? And one of the reasons why is that it's a place where the monks the novices, the lay people don't feel fear. And those of you who come and stay at Bodhinyana Monastery or stay at Jhanagrava or stay at Dhammasara, 